Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. Today, we have, she's a published author, she's a wellness coach, and she is a speaker. And her name is Nikki Sachs, and she has a lot to tell us about mental health and different tools, techniques, and different strategies you could do to apply to your life to help you on a day-to-day -day basis. So Nikki, why don't you tell everybody a little about yourself, what you do? I'm very excited to have you on the show. This is wonderful because such is such an important topic that we need to talk about. Thank you for having me here. Um, so I am a wellness coach. Um, I have studied to do fitness, um, nutrition, uh, life coaching. Um, and during my, with my work that I was doing, I was um, working with a lot of women, mostly uh, middle-aged women, who were looking at trying to improve their health. Um, they would come through and I'd find through the coaching that it wasn't so much their um, physical issues that, or their, their weight that was the issue. It was more a mental um, and what that did was that uh, got me to kind of connect with them in a way because I can identify having struggled with mental illness. Mm. Um, and it sparked me off to write a book about my journey um, because I think a lot of people um, really struggle with their own journeys and to know that they're people that understand and can resonate with, with, their, with what they're going through. Right. Um, you know, makes a difference. So I was, I, I was a wellness coach and a motivational speaker around the topic of wellness and um, of mental illness. Now, you know, we were talking about a little bit earlier, but there is so much stigmatism and labelism in our society. You know, so many people suffer from mental illness. We go through life and, you know, so many things can trigger it. Like you said, it, genetics, it could be from having or traumatic events come in our life. Many things can stir mental illness. Now, um, you had a journey yourself that brought you to where you are now. Why did you have such a, a a passion to help others with mental illness. You know, what is your purpose? And can you tell people a little about that? Um, yeah, I'd love to. My The purpose is that everything you said um, is very relevant. Uh, people have massive stigmas, and I don't know that, uh, you know, that that may change for a long time. Um, I think that people stigmatize uh, mental illness because of fear. Yeah. I think that they fear that possibly it's, you know, in understanding it or accepting it, it they may trigger, it may trigger, trigger something in them. Yeah. So, you know, and mental health is, you know, if I had to read the statistics to you, is just a, a growing concern with all yeah. the trauma. So, and I also believe that every single person uh, does not escape any trauma or loss or grief in their world, no matter how, uh, you know, minor it may seem. Um, and it does eventually um, manifest in some way. So mental illness is, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a myriad of different kinds that, that one could suffer from. Right. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I really did want to, you know, try and not destigmatize because I, 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 I would um, I do my best to do that, but it's, uh, it's really just having the conversations. It's starting conversations with people um, you know, I've found that the book that I wrote uh, certainly does. I've had people that, it, you know, certain things resonate with. And it's not that my story is, is different or, uh, well, this is my story, but it's not, you know, it's amazing how many people can identify with certain things about my story. And they had no idea that they could put down their condition to anxiety right. or depression or in the extreme borderline personality. I think it's very important to when when a person has a story to be able to share that story because you really only need one small component of that story to resonate with someone and the connection is made. And sometimes it's just one little area that you speak about that could actually change a person's life and make them make a person look at things differently. Now, tell us a little about, you know, what you do and how you help people with mental illness. Well, I, I call myself a mental health activist. I do some work um, in Sydney with uh, a company called Lifeline. Um, I help people, you know, I have people reaching out to me all the time 
uh, with regards to from my book and uh, I have put my, my email in the, in the book so that people can reach out at any time. Yeah. So I find myself coaching um, quite a bit. If I can't do it in person, I do it uh, by Zoom. Um, really, I find people want to be heard. Yes. You know, th- th- in life, we have, we have a story. We have, um, and a lot of the time we push down our feelings yes. because we think, well, everybody's going through their own stuff. So what I try and do is just getting, get people to understand that what they're going through despite the process um, is completely normal. Uh, we suffer from grief from minor things even, um, you know, like getting old or our children leaving the home. Yeah. Um, and it has an impact on people's lives and the way that they show up. So I try and help. I also do um, some speaking. I do motivational speaking on resilience, on um, the, what I use to recover and the form, you know, the, the techniques that I use to be able to function on a daily basis. So I speak about that too. Can you share some of those techniques? Because what happens when someone is struggling and they know that they are not feeling the same? They're they're struggling with either a mental illness and that maybe that mental illness is causing now some physical problems. Because as we know, over 70% of um, different uh, mental illnesses and conditions are caused by stress. So what are some of the techniques that you use that you could, if someone came to you and is struggling with a mental illness or struggling with dealing with certain things in their life, what are some advice that you could give to to these people to start them on their way to recovery? You're a hundred percent about the stress, excuse me, stress factor. It's exacerbates most insecurities. So if, one is anxious with stress, it becomes, you know, highlighted. Um, so if there is a genetic component or a, a, a predisposition or whether it's um, just something that comes up, you know, through various experiences in one's life, um, managing mental illness takes work. Yes. And like anything, as I mentioned to you earlier, if anybody is, is diagnosed or there is an issue, it takes work in order to make uh, your life better. Yeah. So when somebody comes to me and they're talking about um, what they're struggling with, what I try and identify with them is the most uh, the most immediate things. I call it um, the the things in their life that are going to impact them the most. So I find out if they're drinking too much, if they are doing something. So one has to um, kind of find a way in order to lower the risk um factors yeah. um and then you know just through a process of um just dis- just dis- discussing what they've been through yeah. um how they actually uh how it affects their life and then there's a process that i um am also studied it's called dialectal behavioral therapy and what that is um is a process of mindfulness mm-hmm. and it's irreg- it regulates um unstable emotions it helps you um, manage your life on a, on a daily basis. And like anything, um, you know, and mindfulness, it needs to be practiced on a regular basis. So yeah. I, I help people learn the mindfulness practices of dealing with acute anxiety, um, managing it on a, on a kind of a daily basis, one day at a time. Right. And um, really is just a support, somebody to lean on and, and you know, say, this is what I'm going through today. How do you think I should manage it? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and yeah, so it really is kind of just like a, a pillar, a sounding board that I, I find myself to be. Yeah. Um, and people that that just need to be heard. There's, uh, right. there's so many people that, um, you know, and everybody's busy. Everybody's busy. Everybody's so concerned with, you know, what's happening and in the world and in their lives with their families that they um, very few people actually acknowledge the fact that they have a mental illness. They think that it's just something that they're going through or, you know, and I'm not a die. I'm not diagnostic. Um, I let I'm sure that when they're talking to me, that the words come out of their mouths. Right. So I'm, I don't, I give them some facts and I can say to them, these are the conditions. This is the symptoms. Uh, do you identify with any of those? Right. So I, I'm in a position to diagnose anybody. I'm not a psychologist, but as a wellness coach, I've found through the work that I've done, 
Uh, many people, you know, eventually come up and they say, look, I'm suffering from acute anxiety. Right. So I give them means and, and techniques to, to deal with that. That's excellent because a lot of times you, you can't tell somebody or, you, you, you know, you have to really have that person dig deep down into themselves and really figure it out for themselves because that's when they'll be more accepting of this situation. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Now, when yeah. you when you talk about different mindful techniques, what type of techniques do you kind of feel are, are beneficial for individuals? Do you like uh, maybe journaling or do you like uh, maybe meditation? Are there certain things, certain mindset uh, techniques that you find very, very beneficial for people who are struggling with mental illness? Um, uh, this, the mindfulness process that I speak of um, is DBT, and it was created in the 70s by a woman that named uh, Dr. Martha Linham. She was actually a psychologist dealing with people who uh, were, were suffering from suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. people who were really, their emotions were totally regulated, um, and she found uh, the system by which you can manage your your daily life. Um, so journaling, all that helps, all that helps. But I find that when people are in acute anxiety or suffering, to ask them to sit and write is very difficult. So what mm. I really focus on um, is breathing. Mm, um, yes. Mindfulness is, so the, the, the mindfulness aspects of it, there is meditation. But again, it's very difficult for people to still their minds when they are in acute anxiety. Yeah. So what I focus on is, is breathing techniques, um, which I have uh, one that I use specifically, which is an immediate kind of calming technique, which is called box breathing. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if you've heard about that. Yeah. Um, it's So the box breathing kind of immediately regulates. If you ever in a situation where you're feeling anxious, going back to your breath, centers you in the moment. Um, I find that a lot of the time people that are going through mental illness, um, you know, anxiety attacks or, or, or problems, yeah. um, they, they're not centered. They're not in the present. I always say that when you look backwards, you get depressed. And if you try and plan the future, you can get anxious. Yeah. So the best thing to do is to sit in the present moment. And as, and as, you know, um, as whatever that may sound, um, it's really, so the focus is that. So it's trying to regulate their emotions through strategy uh, and techniques, um, getting perspective on what is real and what not, is not real. So sitting and saying, okay, you may be feeling this, this is an emotion, but is it actually fact? So let's, we do some fact checking. Um, so the breathing first, we do regular, uh, regulate emotions, but then in an acute situation where somebody is suffering, um, the best thing to do, I find, is to totally transfer their, their, their senses from what they're experiencing. So, um, you know, to uh, hold, hold something that is soft and or change the texture, listen to music that um, can t distract their minds, eat, yeah. eat something that's really strong, like a strong mint or whatever. It's interesting in the moment when yeah. you, everything's going on in your head, just to focus on one scent sense of your body you know mm -hmm. listen to something concentrate on what's going on around you it makes a huge difference yeah. and it sounds small you know it sounds like a small thing but when um when i sit and i coach them through it um eventually it can become habit we yeah. have this amazing ability it's uh you know brain elasticity where um it's called neuroplasty where we have the ability to change our, our habits but it's yeah. an ongoing thing one has to work at it regularly Right. No, I, I agree with you. And I always say the past is the past. We cannot change the past. You know, we need to Absolutely. focus on the present and we can plan for the future, but we don't focus on the future. We focus on the present moment and because we never yeah, know we what all, the future will bring. We us. all speak about the journey. You know, we talk yeah. about the journey of um, what's 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 happened. You know, I um, it's been a, a very tough year for me. I moved to Sydney. I uh, had to sell up my house and my, give my dogs, rehome them. Um, I got to Sydney. I launched my book, which was incredible. Um, uh, then my mom passed away. Oh, um, so I was involved in a, in a dog tech bite. And it's been incredible um, using the skills that I have. I find that I can manage what happens um, and, and so much as, you know, it, I believe the world's not happening to me, 
Uh, mm -hmm. It's something that just happens and I need to respond to it. Yeah. So it's been, um, it's been, yeah, I mean, the, the journey in the last eight years has been remarkable and, and yeah, and, you know, it's helpful. So what motivated you to write this book that you just launched? Well, the interesting, it's called Hiding in the Open and Living Sensitively. Um, I felt for so many years that I was hiding in the open. I felt that I had to wear a brave face. I had to be a perfect mother, um, you know, a, a, a businesswoman, a model. Uh, so it was it was a tough time for me. And eventually I felt the same reason I needed to be heard. I needed uh, to try and make a difference to people that may be suffering. Right. Um, I knew the title for the book where, many years before I actually wrote it. Uh, and then it all just came together. It came together. And I... Um, it's it it really was a culmination of events. Um, I wrote it dedicated to my children because I, they've also experienced some very traumatic things being in my life. Yeah, uh, when I was you know in years and years previously. So um, yeah, I decided to write my book, and it was um, I, I know you've written as well. It's a, it's a it's a true blessing and a, a fantastic journey in order to put your words on paper and share your story. Yes, yes. And I think the best thing about it is that you're not only helping yourself, you're helping others too, because when they read that book, you know, you know, you can change a person's life. And that that's the the greatest achievement that I think anyone in our field, you know, uh, can achieve mm -hmm. is being able to ch change that one person's life. And it, it words can't even, you know, express the value of Absolutely. being able to change one person's life. And it's, it's been so rewarding. And again, I'm sure you shared the experience. I've had people contact me from all over the world and just share the experience and say that they didn't realize that, you know, somebody else felt the same way or that was going through. And that for me uh, would motivate me to write another one. <laughs> yeah. Because it really, it's, you know, just knowing that I'm, I'm sitting here in Sydney and uh, I've been able to help people is just uh, the most incredible feeling. And it's the most remarkable, um, you know, uh, privilege. Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Now, if someone didn't know if they were just not sure what to, where to begin, what would you tell them? Um, begin with uh, trying to recover from a recovery point of view or, yeah. Um, I would say that if anybody is going through a hard time, they need to lean into the people that they can trust and a support group. Um, I know that a lot of people from who, you know, that I've spoken to feel very alone yeah. and they don't know who to reach out to. They don't know who to speak to for various reasons. Yes. Um, one of them, the most common one is that they don't want to seem weak. They mm -hmm. don't want to see that they have, you know, dependency or um, they don't want to be a burden. Yes. My So, you know, my advice always is, the, the, mo the best thing to do is to read. So identify with possibly with books that may help you. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are organizations that, you know, Lifeline is an incredible um, uh, uh, opportunity to, to connect with somebody and really express yourself. Yeah. And what it does is it gets you out of that moment. And there is somebody that's, you know, listening. I also, there's, um, depending on what the, the issue is, I find that a lot of the time people self-medicate with alcohol or other things. Yeah. So there is um, facilities like the 12-step programs, which are amazing and they are free. And if you need support, there are some people there that go through similar experiences. So it's always you know, um, a good place to go. But if, uh, yeah, I, I mean, those are the three things. I think that if, if you're finding it difficult to reach out to people or you don't want to, you feel like you don't want to burden them, it's to educate yourself, to get, you know, to self-empower yourself, um, reach out to people like me, um, and as I say, you know, if, if it's chronic, then go to support groups and right. they're available. Yeah. 
Now, you know, we were mentioning earlier, we were talking about this before the show, so many people, especially in the United States, when you suffer from a mental illness, there is a medication out there. And in the, in the United States, especially, there is nonstop commercials for different medications. And then, you know, and sometimes we need to take a medication, but you can't just rely on popping a pill to feel better. There is a, a blend of cocktail of things that you need to do in order to be able to heal yourself. Now, you were talking about different things that you really should, you know, work on. Can you mention some of the things that you th you feel lead a, a person with mental illness to success and feeling good about themselves? Um, well, um, just with regards to medication, uh, as I mentioned, I think that um, managed well and by professionals. Um, it can really change one's life. I know that there's a lot of people that go onto medication and think that they feel better and go off the medication. Um, if you are, you know, classified to have a mental illness that needs support through medication, I highly advise that that is seen to. There are natural ways that they're coming up with trying to uh, manage it. You know, I know that they use psilocybin microdosing and things like that. I have no experience at that. Um, I think that one does have to do whatever they, they need to, uh, you know, and things like medica meditation uh, also help. So um, the three things, as I mentioned earlier, um, are, you know, to, to empower yourself, um, to take medication as well if you need to, um, and use therapy. Um, so the three kind of pillars of what I think, you know, for recovery would help. Yeah. Um, if that's the question that you, that you, I, yes, <laughs> that I get you ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> I take medication and I know that, that, sorry, there's a funny thing jumping up. There's a picture behind me of a man. So every time I move, it looks like, this. <laughs> um, um, I take medication. I'm, it's not that I'm proud of it. I just know that it uh, is something that I have to do for the rest of my life. Right. It is. And I've acknowledged that. And um, I know that many people may feel differently, but uh, I know firsthand that it is something I, I need to do. Well, I know even for myself, I have a chronic illness and, you know, I have epilepsy, which is controlled right now. And, but I needed to, you know, the medication helps control my seizures, but I also needed to change my life, change my mindset, change the way I dealt with stress, change my sleeping habits, everything I had to change my, I changed my entire That's lifestyle. True. And it wasn't until I incorporated holistic living with medication is when my seizures stopped. So, you know, sometimes it's not just, you know, you, you do need medication in certain circumstances. There's nothing wrong with taking medication, but you can't always say, okay, I'm going to take this medication and I'm going to feel better. You know, you Absolutely. might have to, you know, you, there's techniques, there's strategies, there's tools, there's way of living that's going to benefit you as well. I always, it's called like the cocktail of, of, of health, yes. you know, like, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a combo, I think, you know, cause really our mind is our strongest tool and with the right mindset, anything can be possible. Well, that's very interesting too, because the one thing that I haven't highlighted when you say, you know, how do you manage things? And that's hundred percent correct. There's certain lifestyle things that one can work on changing. Um, and that is, you know, getting enough sleep, making sure I firmly believe that social media is, uh, is a no, no, as far as um, I, I mean, I, I, I don't feel better for going onto social media and I try and avoid things that don't make me feel better. Yeah. <laughs> or mm -hmm. make me feel good. Um, you know, so getting sleep, eating right, uh, minimizing things that are, that can be depressive, like alcohol, yeah. uh, you know, recreational drugs, whatever it is, uh, one needs to be very mindful of that. Um, and it's interesting that you speak about, um, I'm sorry to hear that you suffer from epilepsy, but there is the, the, the medication that um, is given for epilepsy is actually a mood stabilizer. Yes. So that's right. So in a lot of instances, um, people are, are, you, you know, are, are given that to, to, to manage their moods, which is quite incredible. Yeah. And yeah. I think, you know, with with uh sometimes like you mentioned social media you know social media you know that you could you sometimes can find support groups that could be beneficial and some some very encouraging but then you have to also be careful too because there's a lot of 
angry people out there or people with misguided information telling others information that isn't necessarily true or not it's not the best advice so you know Absolutely. i've gotten into groups you know in the past where it made me feel even worse you know and i stood away from them um you know you have to really do what's right for you and i always say you know you have to really examine what you need as a person and you know i i don't think always you know we should always, you know, listen to everybody, you know, because it's, and sometimes too many voices are not good either, because it's very confusing when you have people with differences of opinion coming from all different directions. You know, you have, you should have a goal or an expectation of how, what you want to feel like, who you want to be in the next six months or the nine, next nine months or in the next year, what we, where would you like to see yourself and maybe get an unbiased opinion where you go to a coach or a therapist, mm -hmm. or maybe you go to, if you find an, a good support group where there are good people there that you could really relate to. And I think that's what you, you know, it's the interaction. You'll know when you find those people are, and those are the right people for you and really get into getting that connection. It's so difficult for many, many years. I went to see various therapists, um, you know, and I think a lot of us do. And what happens is you have a bad experience or you just don't connect. And then you think, well, I'm not going to go and see somebody again. And, and it's expensive as well. Yeah. People to seek the medical uh, assistance that they need, psychological assistance is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I find that to try and promote, um, you know, a mindfulness and kind of practice. And it sounds a bit kind of airy fairy, but it really is when one takes control of the way that they manage their lives on a yes. daily basis by eliminating things that don't work for them and incorporating things that do. Yes. Um, and that's where I help people identify what those things are. And it's as simple as going back to basics. It's mm -hmm. as simple as getting in touch with nature um, and spending time. I mean, even if it's one friend that you that you that you can connect with, because as you say, so many people open up the conversation um, to to too many people. They hear too many different, uh, you know, advice. Everybody's got advice to give. So um, it, it really is connecting with somebody asking somebody who is close to you to just say, please walk this journey with me. Yes. I don't know what it's going to look like, but please just, you know, if I need you, can I call you? Um, if I'm having an anxiety, you know, so I always advise somebody to kind of lock in with a person or, or two that they can really yes. rely on. Yeah. And I think, but it is a tricky thing. Yeah. And I think a person has to get to that point where they want to help themselves. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. people don't commit to it. They, they, they want to feel better, but they don't commit. And it's, you know, it's, it's getting to that point where you, you want a better life. And like you said earlier, you know, some people are in denial and it's realizing, you know, and sometimes those outside sources, those friends could say, listen, you're not, you're not acting right. You're not yourself. You know, something's going on. You know, and that might be a trigger point for somebody to actually go and reach out to somebody for help. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the interesting thing, too, is and I've, I've noticed that a lot of people, as you say, uh, are really unhappy with their lives. But even when you tell them or suggest tools and mechanisms by which they can improve their lives, um, some people just don't do it. Yeah, And it's kind of, they get into a, a victim kind of mentality yes, yes. that keeps, keeps them stuck. Yeah. And there's this incredible woman, uh, her, she wrote a book, her name's Carolyn Mace. And she actually wrote about something she coined, a, she, uh, she came up with a word that is so relevant and it's called woundology. Mm. Um, and she says that people sometimes use their situations as currency. So I'm not suggesting everybody, yeah. um, you know, with mental illness, but it's a very interesting take on it. And that is that sometimes people actually by being unwell, um, use that as a currency to manipulate situations, because if they really want to get better, they will do whatever it takes. Yeah. So a lot of the time people say to me, they do want to get better. But each time I speak to them, their stories are the same, despite with the coaching. It's it, the great thing about coaching is that, you know, we work towards something. Yeah. You're kind of saying, OK, so this is where we're starting. This is where we're going. And that's what you've got to do this week. 
right for two weeks until we meet you know with a psychologist a lot of the time and I'm not knocking them it really is a kind of a rehash of your past and you know talking about things that are affecting you in that regard right with coaching it's more an active um kind of situation where you you kind of work a plan and you stick to it and I find that sometimes people um, just want to be heard. They don't really want to, you know, change their their diet, their their sleep patterns, their addictions. Obviously, those are hard. But yeah. um, and they get stuck in that cycle. You know that 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 there's a that that they're a victim. Um, and it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's not a it's not a positive take on it, but it is you know woundology. It's uh, people get stuck there sometimes, so it's yeah. it's cracking that code as well with them. I've seen that so many times. I've seen that with so mm. many clients. They are you know they want they get to the point where they just want people to feel sorry for them. They're the victim. They're the victim. They're the victim. <laughs> And then, like you said, you go to them, you you could give them the advice and you could show them the way, but six months from now, they're still doing the same thing and they're still crying wolf and I'm the victim and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And uh, yeah, it's, um, it really is, uh, it is a, it is a problem because um, they get so stuck in it that it's impossible almost sometimes for them to get out and to to make a difference and then what happens is people decide that they you know don't want to be around you and yeah. it kind of makes you more isolated in right. a way right yeah I think you know like what what, what would be some advice you give people who are are kind of stuck in their ways and is this something that they need to work through or is there advice that you can give people who feel like you know, that they're always the victim, but maybe this is their chance as they're listening to realize that, hey, I'm not a victim. I could change myself. Do you have any advice for them? Well, I think, um, firstly, they need to acknowledge that whatever is happening to them is not the world happening to them. It's they, It's the way that they are responding to the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that people, you know, that are really desperate need to take a good hard look at themselves and start having conversations with themselves about what am I doing yeah. that, is, that is exacerbating my situation? Why is it that I find that, you know, it, this always happens to me? And that always happens to me. And I, I'm also a firm believer on energy. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you get up with a smile on your face, there is absolutely no ways that anybody's going to be able to not smile at you. Yeah. So one has to look at the way that they present themselves and and really respond, you know, work on 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 just one step at a time, one day at a time, just doing positive things to change their situation. And if that means, um, as I said, going, being in nature more or hanging out with people that make you feel good yeah. or going to watch a movie, it's, you know, the difficult thing I think is for people to acknowledge that they are making their situation worse yes. by not doing anything about it. Um, and it's very difficult for, but I think um, it's firstly, people have to acknowledge that um, whatever they're doing is not working. Mm -hmm. And they have to look at another way of, uh, of, you know, of helping themselves. Right. Oh, I agree with you. And I think you brought up a very good, important factor. And you talked about positivity. A lot of times you'll see people attract the same type of energies around them. So if you are a negative person or you are a person that's playing the victim role, or you're with people who don't want to better themselves, you'll notice that their friends all have the same type of energy and the same kind of view on life. So then you can't really get ahead of yourself if you're with those people, because you're all pulling each other down. You're feel, you feel good because you're in the same environment and you're like, oh, I can relate to these people. I'm not, I'm not alone, like you mentioned earlier. But mm -hmm. then you're, in, you're putting yourself in a terrible situation because how can you better yourself when you're around negativity? They're always going to pull you down. So then I think, you know, then you have to take a step back and say, you know, maybe these people aren't good for me. Maybe I need to distance myself. And that could be scary. And then try to look for people who are better influences on you. And But the one problem that I've seen, people think, I can't hang out with them because they're better than me because, you know, they, they've done X, Y, and Z. I'm not good enough to be around them. 
but they are. And they've got their and they've got their stuff together and I don't have my stuff together. And, you know, the interesting thing in, in circles like that, and you're a hundred percent correct, is that if you start changing, making positive changes, the response from those people can be very negative. Yeah. They can kind of say, you know, listen, you know, you, you, you think you're better than us or whatever it is. And that's just, you know, it is, uh, people just want to belong to something and that, yes. and it's very difficult to, to, to get yourself out of that situation. But, you know, part of what I wrote about in my book was my kind of mantra and, and the, the things that I live by yeah. uh, it's, and my man, manifesto and the things that I live by. And the one thing is to rid my life of toxic people. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's and it's difficult to do because it those is. toxic people could be family members. Yes. Um, and they could, you know, definitely they could be people that you work with. And, and all I say is it's not a case of if it's family members or people you work with. Um, you know, you just need to limit the, your interface with them, limit yeah. time, um, kind of no contact rules also apply in situations. And I think one has to be honest with themselves. If you sit and you say, how does this feel for me being around this person? When I, when I see them, are they energy thieves? Do the, do I feel like I, my whole soul gets sucked out or yeah. do I feel as if I'm just, you know, then this doesn't, shouldn't work for me. Yeah. And it's, it's difficult, as I say, because, you know, it's having the belief and it's not a religion. It's just having the belief that it will be okay if, uh, if, if things change, if you change, yeah. because it is proven time and time again, that like seeks like. So yeah. as you're talking about the negative seek negative, the positive will seek positive. And, and that's what I was talking a little bit earlier about was something called neuroplasticity. Yes. And we have, so we have neural pathways in our brains mm -hmm. that it's like a well-worn path that right. you walk down and your brain just automatically goes down that path. Whenever there's a situation that, you know, it's like habit. Yeah. So you, we have as humans the most incredible um, ability to change those neural pathways. Yeah. It's not going to happen overnight. It's like to start. It's like brushing your teeth with your left hand. You know, it's an application that you have, or your right hand, depending on. It's your opposite hand. It's you have to you have to apply yourself every single day so that the that part of your brain just gets rewired. Yeah. And we have the ability to do that as yeah. human beings, which is incredible. So um, it's, I mean, on the energy thing, I'm, I'm a, a very positive believer in that, yeah. um, you know, and yeah, I think that is a, it's a good start, but I, I also just, it's a gut thing. You know, if, if somebody does not make you feel well, it's not going to get better. Yeah. Um, you just need to distance yourself from them. Oh, I, I agree a hundred percent. I call it the inner intuition and you have to really yes. go by it. And I, you know, so many times, you know, people don't listen to their intuition, but you know, that we all have that little person inside us. And sometimes mm -hmm. you'll, you'll think about doing this and then, and you'll hear in, in your inner self will say, Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. And how many times that you did do it and you crushed your intuition and then you're like, shoot, I should have listened to myself, you know? And I really do. Our believe. instincts. Yeah. Our instincts. No. Um, we are we are primal. We pick up things. Um, we are sensory. And what happens a lot of the time is, and I talk about highly sensitive people in my book. Um, you know, a lot of the time, as coping mechanisms, we have had to be hyper vigilant in so many areas of our lives. So we yeah. become, uh, you know, like it's almost like a, a, a deer in headlights. We kind of respond and react and. Yeah. Um, and I think that, yeah, um, it's, you know, being, being um, aware of what you're actually feeling yeah. um, and, and saying my, my instincts are right. If you, if you feel it, you believe it. Right. Um, and having the confidence to do that. I think a lot of people just don't believe in themselves enough to follow that. Yeah. Um, but we've all got it in us. We've all got so many qualities and so many good things. And that's another thing is to try and focus on that. Yes. You know, even if it's one thing, you know, you've got beautiful hair and, you know, and a beautiful face. And, and I think we just need to say, look, I may not like all of me, yeah. uh, but I'm going to work with my eyes and I'm going to, you know, whatever it is. I think it's just learning step by step to, to, to really like yourself by the mere fact that we're miracles to be here. Yes. You know, every single one of us is a miracle. Yes.
that's an excellent point, you know, and, and yeah. I feel too that we could, instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, I think every negative thing that happens to us, I think we could pull something positive out of that, whether it yeah. made us stronger as a person, it gave us knowledge, it may help us look at things differently in life, it may have put us on a different journey, whatever the case may be, I, I guarantee you, if you look back and you look at every negative thing that may have happened to you in the course of your life, you could pull something positive from that, something positive. And I think with that mentality, that could be very helpful as well. What do you think? I agree with you. I think that it's very difficult at the time. I think to look at at the situation, you know, just looking about my recent uh, attack with a, a dog from a dog, you know, um, and you got me thinking about it because um, they are the positive. The positive things is that I've become more aware of certain things that could have been a danger to me, and yes. uh, and and also have discovered the most incredible facility for animals that I had no idea about that I would love to do some work with. Yeah. So there's there are positive, and you have to be open minded about yes. that. It yes. may not it may not land the the um, the the. the the reason may not land immediately, yeah. but I think if you have an open mind to it, um, you know, definitely everything, everything happens for a reason and it leads you on another path, you know, and it just one thing leads to another, whether, and you go along the path based on a good thing or a, or a negative thing. I think you just, yeah, mm -hmm. open-mindedness. Now, if you had to, everything that we discussed today, if you had to give some takeaways to people, what would you, what would you like people to remember certain aspects that we hit, we hit on today that would make it a true impact on their life? I think that the, the, the one thing is, um, by saying one needs to say to themselves, I am worthy. I am enough. Uh, I am, my feelings are real. Um, and and really having those kind of positive talks with themselves. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is reach out, reach out, educate oneself, uh, read matter on things that resonate uh, so that you can believe in yourself and believe that what you're feeling is real. Yes. Uh, and lean into the difficult conversations, lean into um, the people that are offering you support, even if you feel that you're a burden. Um, nothing that you do is not worthy of support and, you know, conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and then, I, you know, find ways, healthy mechanisms in order to deal with your everyday life. Right. And that is as simple as cutting down social media, having enough sleep, going for yes. walks, doing exercise. So um, I, I hope that that's, that's a help. Oh, but definitely. I think self-empowerment, yeah. No, Good. those, those are so. excellent takeaways. I, I like them a lot. Now, where can people find you on the internet? Um, my website is uh, Nikki Sachs, N-I-K-I-S-A-K-S dot -S com. Um, people can reach out for me on, on that uh, anytime. I respond uh, within 48 hours. I um, Also, my book is available on Amazon and Kindle. Um, so that's, uh, that's available there and through some limited bookstores. Um, so yeah, I am, I am contactable and I'm very, I'm very willing to help. And what type of services do you, you do coaching? You're an author, you do speaking. Do you do any type of, do you ever do webinars or anything like that? Or do you focus on those uh, things? Yeah, I focus on those things. Um, I moved to Sydney, uh, in the mid in June, July this year. So I'm still finding my feet, um, working with the PR company. So, um, I'll be getting to a lot of that pretty soon. I'm sure. Oh, excellent. And if, if someone yeah. doesn't live in your area, they could do zoom, they could do coaching. Through Absolutely. Zoom? Absolutely correct. They can call anytime. We can make up, uh, as I said, I, I don't mind getting up at five in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I'm happy to, you know, find a way that can work for them. Yeah. For everyone who doesn't know, Nikki is in, in Sydney right now, which it's five o'clock in the morning. And I'm here on the East Coast by New York. And we are almost about two o'clock right here in PM. So there's a big difference in time right now, but Nikki <laughs> wellness coach, Nikki is willing to go any time frame to help her 
people who, who, who are looking for help and they need a great wellness coach. This has been wonderful. I thank you so thank much you. for coming on the show. You've been such an inspiration and I love how you're so open and you're so verbal and, and caring and compassionate. You know, the things you've said today, not only have you, you've learned about it through the knowledge of your clients, but you've lived it. So, you know, you, you've been on both sides. So you could really have a good connection with somebody because you've gone through it. You've succeeded. You've overcame your obstacles. You've risen above the, the chaos and you had the courage to move forward. And now you're helping others with all different types of mel mental illnesses. So I give you kudos. And, and you wrote a book, which is not an easy thing to do. You wrote a book to share different ways to help themselves, which is amazing. So I suggest everybody, if you're struggling with a mental illness, or if you have questions, even people, family members could probably learn a lot because a lot of times caretakers and family members don't know enough of what their, their, Absolutely. the people and their families are going through. And just to read a book like that, they could actually have an idea of what the person is going through so they can actually connect communicate and work better with that person so yeah, your book I is think, really open to a lot of different I, areas thank you and I, I think that as you say the more you read the more empowered you become um the more you feel that you're not alone and that's important yeah. And, you know, I think that's the main thing. You are not alone. And I, one of my first books I, I wrote was Epilepsy, You're Not Alone, because I think that's the one of the things when people are going through mental illness or chronic illness, physical illness, whatever the case may be, you tend to feel alone. You're going through it. If you don't have people around you, they're going through the same thing. A lot of times, like you mentioned, people are afraid to reach out, are afraid, you know, they don't want, you know, people to know either they're embarrassed they're scared for other people to know. They don't want to be judged. They keep quiet. So they do feel alone. But there are millions of people out there who suffer from mental illness. And it's not something to be ashamed about. It's something, it's just like everything else. It's it's an illness and it can be fixed. You just have to go out there and look for the right people, the right help, and work on yourself and be willing to want to change. Absolutely. And, and it's also good to know that there isn't a person, I believe, in the world that has escaped grief, loss or trauma. Yes. And it has an impact. Um, oh. It has an impact on everything. Um, yes. You know, a lot of people find ways to cope with it, but eventually it does. It does come to the surface. And yes. so just in that, people need to know that they're not alone. Um, yes. uh, yeah, it's, you know, so they're not, uh, if they're not a burden, they're not alone and they can, uh, where, if they work in it, they can help themselves. Yeah. You know, maybe one day you can come back on the show. I'd love to talk to you about, maybe we could talk about trauma and we can talk about grief because that's something, um, everyone has gone through in their life, you know, to some degree and, you know, having someone with your experience and expertise could probably help a lot of people. So, once again, I hope to see you soon. Thank you so much, Nikki, Thank for being you. on the show. This has been a whirlwind. Thank you pleasure. for having me. Oh, Thank you so welcome. much. You're very and, welcome. And uh, have a good have a good evening. <laughs> yes, and have a good morning. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's been lovely. Thank you for the. Oh, for you're the very invite. welcome. Thank you. Have okay. a great day. Bye. You Bye. too. Bye now. Bye.